Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,217. Do your best work. Someone will appreciate it. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in from beautiful Gilroy, California. Sculptures by Richard Starks. Richard, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I am. Ready to go. All right. Richard Starks is a sculptor who thinks big and works big. I mean, really big. He grew up in Watsonville, California, attended San Jose State and worked as a fabricator, making boat trailers and rebuilding engines and so forth. He went back to school to get a teaching credential to teach high school metal shop. Remember those? Along with wood shop and auto shop. He spent 32 years teaching and started creating metal sculptures. He's built dragsters, hot rods, and he has a passion for cars since he left high school. After retiring, Richard started creating very unique sculptures, and his focus is on very large objects. He works in what's called a Core 10 steel. We're going to learn about that primarily. And his work has included everyday objects he recreates in a massive scale, as well as a variety of unique modern sculptures and public installations. And I'll say I had the pleasure of meeting Richard and seeing some of his work in person at SEMA last year. Wow, this guy makes some really cool stuff. So Richard, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a brief moment, share a little more about your career and your passion for automobiles and creating some really cool things? Sure. I started... uh... As a metal shop teacher in high school, I realized fairly quickly that the salary that I got from my teaching uh, wouldn't allow me to do too much extra stuff. For example, I wanted to build a street rod, and uh, to do that, I decided I had to do side jobs to to, uh, pay for it. So I started Mm -hmm. a fabrication business uh, building weight training equipment, and I had some contracts with local stores and individuals as well. And when I first started building the, it was a 33 Ford three window coupe, I told my two daughters that I'd give them a ride home from their eighth grade graduation. And they thought that was a neat idea. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't finished uh, for that time and event. So I then told them that I'd give them a ride home from high school graduation. They, they thought that was a pretty neat idea as well. Unfortunately, it wasn't finished for that event either. So I told them I would give them a ride home from their college graduation. and <laughs> I see a trend here. <laughs> yeah. However, they weren't interested. They kind of got the hint that uh, things take longer than uh, I thought. And uh, that was a learning experience as well. And yeah. so it, it uh, turned out not to be done for their college graduation as well. So that's a kind of a start. Uh, the fabrication allowed me to do things that the teaching salary wouldn't. Absolutely. You know, I love this because this day and age, we would call that a sidepreneur, somebody who's picked up something in their spare time to make some extra money that might eventually grow into their own business. And no doubt that uh, training that you did, fabricating, uh, definitely helped with what you're building today. And we're going to learn more about that. But first, I always like to ask my guests for a success quote or a mantra. This is some kind of saying that's been instrumental in forming your life and your success. I always say it's a nice way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars Yeah. So, Richard, take the wheel. Well, inside my shop, if you ever come over, you'll see a lot of signs and quotes hanging on the wall. One of them is, uh, do your best work. Someone will appreciate it. And (laughs) um, that applies to myself quite a bit. The quality of the work that I do affects my attitude and uh, how I work. I see these shows on TV where everything is rushed. Everybody's in a hurry to get things done quickly. And for me, that doesn't work. Uh, When I start to speed up, I start getting sloppy. And uh, I don't like that. It affects my attitude. And uh, so I have to remind myself to slow down and do the best I can do. Even though someone might see the area that I'm working on, on a particular sculpture or work piece, uh, I still want to do a nice job on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's wonderful concept in any kind of work that you do, but especially when you're creating 
artistic objects and the incredibly unique things that you create because some of the things that you create and the latest one I saw on your Facebook page was a giant can opener and I'm talking how how long how many feet long was that thing well uh, it's about 4 feet it's not that big so i mean it's uh-huh. big but it's not and, <laughs> yeah well it's a lot bigger than the one in my kitchen drawer that's for sure yeah you get a lot of leverage with that one but it has a big uh, <laughs> you know big bottle as well so it's a nice thing yeah, it is. I, it is. Well, again, listeners, uh, I'll put links on the show notes page here for for Richard because you can go and check out some of these objects. They'll blow you away. And the fact that not only do you build objects that people can identify with, you do some really cool creative abstract objects, some beautiful installations and things. But I like that concept. You know, everybody should slow down, take their time and do the best work they possibly can. Definitely something you want your surgeon to be doing when you're laying on the operating table as well. Well, let's have a story that instigated your passion for cars. You talked about that car that you were trying to get done for your girls, but is there a pivotal moment when you look further back in your life when you knew you were going to be a car guy? Well, I think it was in high school, actually, uh, probably a freshman or a sophomore. And I think it was around 1960 in a Life magazine article on Don Garlitz. I remember the picture of him uh, going down the drag strip with an ambulance following him. And... uh for some reason, that just got my attention. And they, they, of course, the smoking tires and his black paint job with the red flames, with swamp rat written on the side, it just stuck in my head till this day. And uh, we wow. used to spend tons of time at lunchtime um, in the uh, classroom just drawing pictures of cars and stuff on the wall or on, excuse me, on the blackboard. And, I was going to uh, say, you're a troublemaker yeah. when you're a kid, weren't you? No, no, I wasn't. <laughs> I so that, I that, figured you weren't. That's one of the earliest things that stands out for me. Yeah. You know, you're in good company here, Richard, because you and Don Garlitz are both Cars Yeah alumni now. Uh, Don was on my show a few years ago. Uh, he was a guy that I saw race back when I was a little kid. And my dad took me up to a drag strip in Orange County and saw the swamp rat go down the track. And uh, if you haven't listened to his show, you or the listeners here, go back. You'll find his show on the Cars Yeah website. Uh, really an interesting guy. I love Don Garlitz. Great character. Uh, still working hard today. Still doing stuff and still building a dragster, too. So, uh, guys, not quit moving ahead. Yeah, pretty incredible. Especially after some of the very near-fatal accidents that he's had in his life as well. What I want to do is take a look at some of the roads you've driven down, Richard, and talk about a big challenge or a big failure. These are wonderful learning lessons in life. Uh, no doubt you've learned a lot as you've ventured into this uh, new job or trade. I shouldn't say a job. It's a it's a way of life that you're creating things. But walk us through one of those experiences, if you would, and tell us how that helped you gain even more momentum as you move forward in your career and your business and your life. Well, there were quite a few, but one that stands out in my memory, and that uh, was a comment that I made when I first started teaching. I used to tell everybody that would listen uh, that if I ever had to teach wood shop or electronics, I'd quit teaching. However, um, later on down the road, when my signups dropped off and I was then uh, put in a position to make a decision on teaching those things or losing my job, I decided, well, now I have to teach it. And uh turns out that it was actually a good experience, both in wood and in electronics, because it helped me in when I did the wiring on a Model A that I was uh, building. And also, uh-huh. when I did the uh, my shop here, where I do my sculptures, I was able to do the wiring myself. And uh, I don't think I could have done those without the uh, confidence that I got from teaching those two other classes. You know, this is an incredibly... A wonderful lesson here you're, you're teaching us, teacher. I'll call you teach because you were a teacher for so many years. Uh, is that try something that maybe you don't think you like or something you don't think you'll be good at because you might learn something, right? That's right. I didn't uh, yeah. want to do it at all. I was totally against it, but it turned out it was a good thing. Absolutely. You know, I want to touch on this a little bit is teaching shop classes because we all over the last 10, 15, 20 years have seen these shop classes disappear from high schools and junior highs for obvious or various reasons. Who knows what they might be? But maybe you could share with us some of the concepts or thoughts you have of what kids, even if they went on not to ever work in metal again, what were some of the valuable lessons that they learned coming to a shop class, working with their hands, being... Or just learning a trade, if you will, or a craft, if you will. What's your opinion of that? 
Well, I think it's extremely important. Unfortunately, as you said, uh, there are many reasons why the classes have been eliminated or cut way down to just a few. And uh, I found that the students that I had were, uh, after they were there a while, began to fit into the program and, and found that it was a fun thing to do because it could actually create something that in the other classes they couldn't do. We had a lot of structure, which some of the class, other classes didn't have. For me, that was a good thing. And I think for the students who I had that were working in, with metals and with their hands, uh, there's some kind of an order that needs to be established to, to do something. Where do you start, for example? It's an important thing. Everybody wants to just jump in, bend something, cut something, and that's not always where you start. So uh, planning something from the get-go and then seeing it through all the way to the finish is an important facet of uh, feeling confident about um, working with tools and equipment. Well, and that lesson can transfer into anything, if you will. So many times people jump into something without thinking it through, without planning. They get into it, and then it's all messed up. They can't finish it. They get discouraged, and they quit, and they never try it again. But I remember back to my wood shop class, my metal shop class, auto shop class. I mean, I really enjoyed those. I still have the wooden step stool I made in junior high wood shop. I still have the hammer I made in junior high metal shop. And, of course, I've carried some of those skills I learned in auto shop throughout my life. So, uh, yeah, it's a tremendous thing. I wish there was more of that. Um, are you? I know you're not teaching anymore, but are you hearing any rumblings in the school or maybe old friends that this might come back someday? Well, I hear that, but um, what I see is something else. You know, the the uh, the rumor that used to be going around, or it wasn't a rumor for me, it was uh, everybody's going to go to college, and uh, they don't need this shop stuff, so... Um, you know, I need more math and more science. But on, in my class or the other, any of the shop classes, you get to apply that stuff, and the students can actually see where they can put that math to work and how it makes sense. We we used to ask, well, at least I did in my math classes, is could you give an example where you use this? And the teacher says you're going to need it next year in the math. But in a metals class, you could say this is where you need this geometry is going to be used for aligning the frame for a car, for example, or making something square. And right. uh, so we actually put it to put the math to use in the class. Nice. Uh, very well said. Yeah, it's a sad, sad fate uh, of what's happened in the school districts, I think. Uh, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for kids to explore things and we could do a whole show on, is college right for everybody? Absolutely not. Uh, there's so many other opportunities these days, but uh, that's for another day. Let's have a little bit of fun and talk about your first really special vehicle. Maybe it's that uh, the Ford you've been working on forever. Uh, is there a car that was the first one for you that had great meaning? Uh, yeah, there was. Um, I was able to purchase a 1957 Chevrolet two-door Post. That was the hot deal in one at the time, and I still like them. It was really special. I couldn't wait to take the front bumper off so it could look like a gasser. My parents kind of wondered what I was up to, but uh, that's sort of what I had to do. And uh, it uh, gave me a lot of experiences that uh, in some cases cost me a lot of money, but that's uh, life. Yeah, absolutely. For me, it was a 67 Carmen Ghia. Uh, in high school that I uh, promptly after buying tore it completely apart and rebuilt the whole thing, repainted it, did all sorts of cool stuff. But yeah. Um, and again, it's the working of the hands that is so rewarding because you can stand back, even if you don't do the greatest job. Hey, I did that and it'll be a little better next time. So very cool. Well, how about seller's remorse? Is there a vehicle you've let go that you really wish you had back? Actually, I had another, I, I had three 57 Chevys and one of them was a uh, station wagon. And that's the one that I wish I would have kept. It was, uh, you know, I bought bought it for seventy five bucks from a friend. And oh gosh! It was sitting on his side yard, and it had uh, sunk in the dirt and or the mud actually, and the mud had hardened. So we had to pull it out of there with the chain and a, another vehicle. And uh, all the four tires were flat. But uh, I rebuilt the whole thing, and it, we used it to tow my dragster to the races. And that thing was uh, a neat car. It had a lot of room. And uh, it was fun to drive. No doubt. Yeah, those are cool. 
Well, what are you working on these days, Richard, that has you really excited and fired up? Because I've had the pleasure of seeing many of the pieces. I saw a tremendous piece when you were at SEMA that I just went, oh my gosh, how, how did you make this thing? Do you have some cool projects coming up this year that have you really fired up? Well, yes. Uh, I usually, when people ask that, tell them that the one I'm working on is my favorite one. And um, <laughs> so it, it varies. You know, that the focus of attention is on the one I'm doing right now. And believe it or not, I'm still working on the uh, bottle opener piece, and uh, it's not totally done yet. So uh, I'm still trying to work out some details on that thing. Usually, uh, and one of my issues that I've had is when I finish a, a sculpture, most of the time I have no idea what I'm going to do next. And for me, that's a real problem. And it uh, tends to affect my mood quite a bit until I get a spark for what I'm going to do next. And uh, currently, I have a list of quite a few things, a lot of, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but several abstract pieces. So I do have something waiting for me to do when I finish this uh, bottle cap opener. Uh, So Mm -hmm. that's kind of a relief. Describe the object that I saw at SEMA, because, and I'm going to put a picture up of that, you and I standing with that piece. It's a piece of an automobile, but describe that for our listeners, size, scale, what it is. Well, I can't remember exactly what the, what scale I used at the moment, but uh, it's a rocker arm, a roller rocker arm that uh, was a, uh, it's called flashback because it's uh, in, uh, when I was building my dragster, I wanted to get some Iskandarian roller rocker arms for that engine that I was working on for the dragster. And uh, I went up to uh, Vic Hubbard Steed Marine in Hayward, and I asked him if I could buy one rocker arm, and they said, no, you have to buy a whole set. And uh, being in college at the time, I had no money, so uh, but I could afford one, which at about that time was about $10. I said, well, what happens if I break one? You know, and I need another one. I don't want to have to buy a whole set. And uh, he hesitated, and he said, well, okay, if that's the case. So I was able to end up with a set of 16 over a period of probably a year, uh, buying them one at a time. And so this particular uh, sculpture is a memory of mine during going through the process of saving up, sacrificing, and purchasing rocker arms one at a time. Yeah, it's about the sculpture itself is about 450 pounds, I think. Uh, and uh, it, uh, like I said, about four feet. Uh, the rocker arm is about four feet. I don't remember what the scale is on it now, but uh, it's large. Yeah, it's really large. And I mentioned at the opening, you work in what you call Core 10 steel primarily. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, well, Core 10 is uh, another name. There's got many names. Weathering steel is one name. But it's a, a low carbon steel that has some additional alloys added to it, like carbon, not excuse me, copper. And uh, that if the alloys that they've added affect the uh, way the material rusts. And uh, the rust actually is a bad thing for most people, especially if you work in cars and things like that. You don't want rust. But for uh, arty things and uh, material that's going to be left outside, the uh, the core ten steel allows the material to rust on the surface. And the uh, surface rust is a real tight rust. It's not flaky. And it actually protects the metal underneath the rust. So that's why they can get a long lifespan out of the material that's uh, or things that are made out of core 10. And uh, you see it a lot on bridges and um, guardrails and decorative type stuff on homes and buildings. Now that rocker arm piece, though, that was finished to look like, at least if I remember right, I mean, it had coatings. And, I mean, it was cool. It was shiny in some parts, and it looked like it was protected, so it wouldn't rust. Right. Well, it wasn't made out of core 10. It was made out, there was no core 10 on that at all. It was the aluminum and uh, stainless steel and mild steel, and uh, everything was painted on that thing. Yeah, it was beautiful. And that spring, the valve spring on that thing, was incredible. You were telling me about how you made that. I mean... This, I, I forget the diameter of that spring. It was huge. It's about, I think, about two feet in diameter, uh, maybe a little less. Uh, but um, I'd like to pay credit for bending it, but I didn't. I actually had to find a place to uh, bend it for me. The I looked into buying a bender, but they were very, very expensive. And even the expensive ones wouldn't do 
uh, the radius of the bend that I needed. So fortunately, I found a place in San Jose that could do that, and uh, they made a bunch of pieces, and I spliced them all together to come up with the right size spring height and so forth. Very cool. Love it. Well, Richard, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsors. Everyone who knows me knows I'm really picky when it comes to my cars and keeping them looking new. I'm a huge fan of Covercraft floor mats. I've protected my vehicle with their products for decades. Want to keep your vehicle's interior looking new? It's easy with Covercraft floor mats. They will protect your vehicle's factory carpets from daily abuse, weather, pets, children, weekend adventures, and those everyday spills. It's a fast, easy, and stylish way to keep your vehicle looking new. Covercraft floor mats come in a wide variety of styles, materials, and configurations, all designed for maximum protection. In addition to Premier Plush and Berber Custom Floor Mats, you'll also find cargo liners, canine cargo area liners, dash covers, and sunscreens. Enhance your vehicle's looks while protecting the factory finishes with easy-to-install and easy-to-clean floor mats. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars Yeah sent you. That's Covercraft.com. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. Hey, Mark Green here from the Cars Yeah podcast. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? That's right. Cars Yeah is now on MAV TV. I visit some of the past Cars Yeah guests and take you along for the ride. Go to MavTV.com to learn more where you can enjoy Cars Yeah TV. MAV TV is also available on DirecTV, Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through MavTV.com online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. All right, Richard, we are back, and I have a bit of an introspective question for you. If you were a car, if you woke up tomorrow and you were manifested as a vehicle parked in the garage, what would Richard be and why? Okay, uh, well, it'd be either a Subaru CrossFit or my Ford pickup truck. Oh, and why is that? Well, because everything works on these two cars. Currently, and uh, with, <laughs> at my age, uh, not everything's working the way I'd like it to. <laughs> Parts are wearing out, and uh, it's hard to change them out. That happens, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Well, especially with the physical work that you're doing. I mean, the kind of stuff you're doing, you're you've got. I mean, you're working in steel, heavy stuff. So uh, I would imagine you've got to be smart about the way you move things around. Yes, y- yeah, I do. But I have to correct you on one thing. Uh, the you mentioned that I do huge, large pieces, and, uh, you know, it's all relative. So it's large to some people and small to others. So, you know, comparing myself to other sculptors who actually do uh, large pieces, mine are fairly small. But I do take pride in doing them myself, which does limit the size of the uh, sculpture. Since I don't farm it out, It, it you know, I have to be able to handle the stuff in my shop and with the equipment that I do have. So uh, that that has a big effect on, or excuse me, a factor in uh, deciding what size it's going to be. No doubt. Very cool. Well, we're going to enter the last lap here, and I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some quick blips of the throttle answers. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? Um, probably something about uh, it's going to cost more than you planned on, and it's going to take longer than you expected. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's the story about the car with your daughters at the beginning. That's always the way it is. Yeah. Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your successes over the years? Well, I try to do my best work and don't skimp on things, even if the part you know isn't going to be shown. And it's still there and I know about it. So I want it to be quality all the way through. How about a resource? There are lots of great resources for us these days. Is there one you'd like to share? Uh, well, the Alliance Welding Supply in San Jose is a place I visit quite a, often to get my welding mm-hmm. supplies, and they've helped me out over the years, uh, both in teaching and now that I'm on my own. So uh, 
a little shout out to them wouldn't hurt. Absolutely. Now, if I could wave my magic wand and arrange for you to have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry or the art industry, for that matter, since you're an artist, living or deceased, who would that be? Well, depends what you mean by artist. But, uh, you know, I uh, think a lot about this and I, I this may sound odd, but Warren Buffett is a guy that uh, I'd probably like to sit down and have a moment or two to ask him a couple questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting fellow. Successful, no doubt, but uh, he is an interesting fellow. If you read about him a bit, he's he's a little bit of a different kind of guy, considering he's one of the wealthiest people on the planet. Um, what is it about? What was the first question you would ask him? Probably, uh, what's the best way to locate people's contact information? Yeah. I'm, th- that's one problem I have: is how do I locate people and contact them? Because I think a lot of my sculptures would appeal to a certain person or group of people and I'm not always clear on how to uh, you know locate uh, the information that I need to contact them well as my son would say to you because he works there if you can't find it google it <laughs> so right. that's what he's always telling me just google it dad you'll find everything you need to know it's amazing what you can find these days and for me Tracking down as many people as I am, maybe offline we can talk a little bit about that. And I give you a few tips and hints that have helped me on chasing down now over 1,200 people uh, that I've had on this show. So uh, very cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You bet. It's a very unique answer for someone who would be talking to Warren Buffett. I think most people would say, how do I get rich like you? So, uh, but uh, that's great. I love that. How about a book? Is there a book you've read that you think our listeners would enjoy reading? Well, there's one that uh, I enjoyed. My mom used to read it to me when I was a kid, and I still have it, and uh, it's still a favorite of mine. It's called Men of the Mississippi, and that's M-I-N-N. It's about a snapping turtle and his uh, journey down the uh, Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Interesting. I've never heard of that book. I'm going to have to get my hands on that. Yeah, I don't know know if it's in print still. I think it comes and goes, but uh, again, it's one of my favorites. There you go. A unique book. I like it. Well, you can find everything Richard is sharing on his Cars Yeah show notes page. Just go to CarsYeah.com. Type in Richard Starks. Make sure you put an S on the end of that. S-T-A-R-K-S. All right, Richard, we are up to the checkered flag. And this last question is kind of a fun one, but it could be a bit of a doozy. Today, I'm going to buy you any cool collector toy play car in the world. Doesn't matter who owns it. I'm going to get my hands on it. Park it in your garage there in Gilroy. But there's a couple rules to this game. One is, I want you to drive it and enjoy it. So no garage queens. Secondly, you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other welding equipment or toys with. And thirdly, it's the only one cool car you can have in your garage. You can keep your daily drivers, though. What's it going to be? Well, there's one that always fascinated me. It was a 64 Nova. It was Doug Thorley's. I believe that's how you say his name. And uh, it was an AFX Chevy Too Much, it was called. And it just fascinated me then and still does. So if you remember that one, it was a high-rise, uh, kind of a reddish metal flake. Uh, I don't know if it was metal flake or not, maybe a candy red. But it was a really neat looking, uh, one of the early funny cars. I, that's the way I remember it anyway. Wow, cool. Well, I will uh, see if I can figure out where that is. I'll just Google it. I'm sure I can find it. And those listeners out there can find that 64 Nova as well. That's Doug from Doug's Headers, by the way. That was the... From Doug's Head? Okay. Doug's Headers. Okay. That's Very cool. Guy, yes. Yeah. Well, and I was going to mention earlier, you mentioned uh, Ed Eskandarian. Again, he's another uh, Cars yeah alumni of yours now because he was my... Actually, the oldest guest I've had on the show uh, when I interviewed him last year. Uh, Esky, as we all know him for his cams and uh, all the things he's contributed. So. uh you guys are all good Cars yeah alumni buddies now, so very cool. Nice. Richard, you've taken, you've taken me on a great ride today. Really enjoyed learning more about you and what you do. I love your artwork. It's absolutely fantastic. Very happy to bring it to the Cars yeah listeners' attention. Could you offer us one little parting piece of wisdom before you race off into the sunset in that 64 Nova? <laughs> well, a long time ago when I was in the Navy, uh, my brother was driving me back to... Uh, the Naval Station, and we were talking about work. And uh, he suggested something uh, that made sense more so now. And he said, someday, all of your life's experiences and skills will come together, and you'll know what you want to do. And uh, now that I'm retired, I can 
do what I want, create sculptures. And uh, I think about his advice that he had at that time that uh, is true now. Absolutely. (laughs) You have a smart brother. Well, thank you for your service in the Navy as well. I appreciate that very much. And what's the best way for our listeners to reach out and find you should they want to see what you do and maybe even have you make something for them? Well, the best way is just go to my website. All the contact information is there. It's richardstarks.com, and that's all you need. Pretty easy. I'll make sure I put a link to that on Richard's show notes page. Check out what Richard creates. I think it's going to blow you away. It's going to put a big smile on your face as it has me. He does some really incredible things. Richard, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing your story and experiences with Cars yeah? Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important, too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimble.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.